welcome to you. Uh, if you're new to the family or you've just been here a short time, extra special welcome. We are glad that uh, you have found this space and we trust and hope and pray that it becomes home for you, that you find a space where you feel like you belong. Um, we are excited for where we are and what we get to do. And if some of you are still trying to figure out, okay, why are you here? Why is the table here? There's no ban. We're going straight into the message today. So uh, if, you, if you're the kind that needs some prep time, you got about 30 seconds and then we're in. Um, but in all seriousness, that we do want to just make sure that you are welcomed. And one of the things you'll find out real quick is that we are Jesus people. And by Jesus people, we believe that Jesus is the center of everything we do. We believe that he is uh, the big deal. We believe that there is no change that will happen in your life outside of Jesus. That, that if you want a changed life or, or you want or you're struggling or striving uh, to see a difference made in your life, that, that the person of Jesus is the thing that changes you. That, that when we stand here, the only reason we stand here and say what we say is because um, there is nothing else that has changed my life other than Jesus. And reality is, I don't know about you, but uh, there's these thing called bookstores. There's like three of them left on the whole planet. Uh, but I love reading and I love uh, seeing, seeing what people's thoughts are and stuff and all that kind of thing. But have you noticed that it's kind of embarrassing if you go into a bookstore, especially the Christian section of the bookstore? And here's what I mean, that you get a whole bunch of books that sound like seven keys to your best life yet. And then right next to it, you got five keys to your best life yet, right? And it's like, okay, what happened? Did the other guy decide that the two didn't matter, so now we're at five? But, but reality is you get all these books that tell you if you just do this step, this step, this step, this step, you will have your best life. The problem is a lot of times that, that the reality of change is based on who you are and how hard you work for it. And the whole point behind this series we're in called Ripple is the idea that at the center of you as a believer in Christ is the person of Jesus and everything else ripples out from him. And so the issue with something like a self-help book is that it places me at the center and I just got to work harder on me. The reality is what we believe is the change agent on the planet is the person of Jesus. And when you keep him at the center, he will make you look a whole lot more like him as you progress through life. Amen. And that as you walk through life, which, what you're going to find is, is that as he changes you, everything else around you, the ripples of your life change with him. And so we're going to dive into that. We're in the book for the entire summer. Um, called Colossians. If you have a Bible, you can turn there. Some of you are like, oh, we're really, this really is a sermon. Yep. <laughs> you got it. And the book of Colossians is actually a letter that was written to a church at Colossae by a, a man named Paul. If you've been here for the last few weeks, um, other than the Sean week, you, we worked our way through chapter one and we're answering what Paul's doing is he's writing this book is, or writing this letter is he's answering for the people at Colossae. And what, here's why it's important. You need to understand that, that these letters were written to real people with real problems. That these letters were written into a real context where things were happening. And so that defines for us some of the context that we find on the page. And in chapter one, he hits this section on who Jesus is specifically because he's answering one of the, the threats, if you like, to the community there that inside of that church, people were saying Jesus isn't really God. That Jesus is just like a good teacher or maybe he was a prophet, but he, he really wasn't God. And, and so what you get inside of that is you get Paul writing in the first chapter this detailed, this is who Jesus is and this is what he's done. That he is supreme above all. And if you're here and you're going, I don't know what my purpose in life is. I don't know. You can actually go to chapter one and start reading at verse 15. And you're going to hit a, hit a verse in there that tells you this, that everything was created by Jesus and 
for Jesus. So, so that tells you instantly, if you're here and you're going, I don't know what my, I don't know what my purpose is, that inside of that, what you find is you were created by Jesus. So you have a purpose in creation. The way you're wired is the way you need to be wired. And what you get out of that is you're created for Jesus. So, so, so your life, if you're looking for purpose, your life can, can't hit a bigger purpose than when you align it with God's in the uniqueness of your creation. And as you pour out following God, what you lean into at that point is you lean into the holy purpose on your life, that your life was created intentionally because God's got stuff for you to do that no one else can do. And so then we hit chapter two. And in chapter two, he kind of shifts to the second threat that was going on where they were saying, Jesus isn't enough. You need more. There's this, there's this secret part of religion that you need to, to become full, if you like. It says in verse one of chapter two, I want you to know how hard, how Paul, how hard Paul is um, working, contending for and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. So he's going, hey, I may not have met you in person, but you need to know I'm contending for you. Now, the word contend uh, carries with it very specifically this idea of intense energy that Paul's going, hey, I'm putting out this intense energy on your behalf. I need you to get these things. And specifically, then he goes into in the next verse, in verse two, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart, united in love, so that they may have the full riches com of complete understanding in order that they may know the mysteries of God, namely Christ. So he goes, hey, I I'm contending for you. I'm, I have this intense energy and output towards you. But specifically, it's so that these four things will be true in your life. That, that, that you would be encouraged in heart. And that word heart, you can translate soul. That you would be encouraged on the inside. Specifically, the, the, the takeaway for us is this, that you here today and you're going, man, I, I don't know. I don't feel encouraged on the inside. In fact, life has been the way it has. I feel discouraged on the inside. Then what Paul's telling them here and translates to you, what he's about to write should encourage you in your soul. That, that, that when we get done with this, your soul should be full, should be encouraged, and should be ready to move on. Specifically, he goes, then I'm also contending, I'm also, my goal is that you would be united in love. And united has to do with commitment. That we would be committed to one another as a family. In love. That we would be committed that, that I care for your needs over everybody. He's going, I'm writing so that you understand how to, com how to commit to one another, unite to one another in love. And then on top of that, he goes, hey, and I, I want you to know, I want you to get complete understanding. Specifically of the mystery. I want you to get complete understanding specifically of the mystery that is Christ. So what he's saying is, hey, I know there's a threat. I know some people have been standing up saying, hey, you know what? You need this other thing. And if you got this other thing in your faith, you'd be, you'd be like a super Christian, right? You'd be a step up from everybody else. And he says, no, I want you to know the full knowledge of the mystery. And so then specifically then from this point being his goal, he carries on and says, in whom, in Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Verse four, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in the body, I am present with you in the spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith is. And so he says specifically that I, I'm telling you these things, these things I'm about to tell you next. I'm telling you them so that those people around you that are trying to make you believe that Jesus isn't enough, that I'm going to tell you he is enough. And so then he dives into the next verse, verse six. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. So he says, hold up, hold up. If this is your goal, that you would be encouraged in your soul, that you would be 
united in commitment to one another, that you would have complete understanding of the knowledge of what you've been given, and you would understand the mystery that is Christ. He says, here's what you need to do. Don't move Jesus from the center. Okay? Don't move Jesus from the center. In, in the picture, if you like, of the ripple, don't move Jesus out of the center that creates the ripple that is your life. How does he say that? He says, so, in verse 6, so then, just as you receive Christ Jesus, as you receive Jesus, carry on. As you receive Jesus, carry on specifically in him. Okay, so, so that begs a question, right? How did you receive Jesus? How did Jesus come? And, and the language here is actually what was taught to you and what you received. And when you receive what was taught, what you then translated to your life and how you stepped out in this faith journey with your encounter with Jesus. Now, Paul wrote another letter to the Ephesians. You don't need to turn there. But Paul wrote another letter to the Ephesians. And in verse chapter two, verse eight, he says this, for it is by grace you have been saved. It is by grace you have been saved. It is not through faith and not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So he goes, hey, the way, the way that you were saved, the way that you received Jesus, the story you were told is this. It's grace through faith. The way you were rescued is grace through faith. The way, the way that you entered into this whole thing, the way that Jesus became the center mark, if you like, was grace through faith. And here's what's interesting. There's a tension in every single one of us. And the tension is this, that I just want to be good enough. That I just want to earn it. That I just want to, to prove that I'm enough, right? Well, what Paul is saying is, hold up. As you receive Jesus, then carry on in him. How do you keep Jesus the center? As you receive him, you carry on in him. How did you receive him? By grace, through faith. What is grace? Something you cannot earn. You don't deserve. It is given to you. It is, it is when you come to the reality that I cannot get this for myself. Essentially, I cannot rescue myself, so I need Jesus to rescue me. And that, that, the grace piece of that is Jesus goes and rescues you, and you did nothing to get it. And he says, that's how you started. Carry on. Don't move from how you started. How did you start? Grace through faith in him. You ever notice that the tension in our lives is, is, is will we respond out of what we're doing? So, for example, my wife, the Bible tells me I am to love like Jesus loves the church, that I should lay my life down for her. Right. So what that means is everything that, it, that, it, that I want should be sidebarred for everything that she wants. Right. Everything, everything in my life should have her first in perspective to the point that I would lay down my life, my desires, my will for what's best for her. You ever tried to do that? Oh, man, I'm going to love my wife like Jesus loves the church. Right. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to try. It's not long till you're like, man, it's too hard, Jesus. I can't do this. I give up. Right. The only times I have ever truly loved my wife like Jesus loves the church is when I operate from a position of grace where I stay centered. Jesus is the center of my life and whatever flows out is grace. Anytime I love my wife, it is grace pouring through me because everything about John is the opposite of what I'm doing. You don't believe me? You got kids? Man, your kids look like you. They sound like you. And that means they know how to push your buttons, right? You ever get to the point where you're like, oh, I've had it with my kids. 
No, I'm the only one. Oh, you, you all are so spiritual. Let me tell you. Let me tell you, liars, God's going to judge. Just kidding. But you ever notice the times when you are kind towards your children, when they are in that mood, when they want that thing and it's in the middle of the store and everybody's watching, right? And you're kind and you're gentle and you long suffering. That is not of you. It's of God. It's grace pouring through you because everything natural within you wants to kill the human being. (laughs) As you receive Jesus, continue on. And what happens if I receive Jesus by grace, then the ripples from my life will be grace. See how it works? If you earned your faith, I guarantee you, you're looking at others and go, you better buckle up, sonny. (laughs) Right? You better work a little harder at that. Well, that should tell you something about how you think you came to faith. Because in your mind, you probably think you came to faith by how hard you worked versus by I did nothing for it and Jesus just lavished it on me. And when I stay in that space, that's what I'm supposed to say. So don't move from center. There's point number one, right? And we wasted way too much time getting there. But that's point number one. Don't move Jesus from center. Got it? Don't move Jesus from center. So then... Then I got to go back to Colossians. Could have preached a whole different sermon. Okay. So then he says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. So what he's doing is he's leaning into the threat. So he's saying, hey, 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 as you receive Jesus, stay there, rooted, strengthened, built up, right? Stay there, overflowing with thankfulness. Stay there. By the way, Don't let them deceive you and pull you off center. Don't let people that think it's not by grace to pull you off center. Don't let people put legalism and laws on you that God himself doesn't even put on you. What he's saying is don't get pulled off center. There are those around you that want to pull you off center. They want to make it about what we earn and how hard we work. And he says, no, 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 no. Don't let them deceive you. Don't let them deceive you. He carries on then. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. So so he goes now, he goes, okay, if we're not to move from center, if we're not to move Jesus from center, he goes, hey, I really want you to know what is the center. And he goes, all the fullness of the deity of God dwells in bodily form in Jesus, what you need to do right now is you need to highlight, underline, bold, put a box around, whatever you got to do, star the top of the page, because you will run into people that do the same thing to you that was happening at this church at Colossae where they go, hey, hey, you know what? I don't know if Jesus was God. And you're like, I got a verse for that. Hang on one second. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Jesus was, is God. That in him, all of the deity of God dwelled in bodily form. Now, why is that? Why is that important? Because the very next line, and in Christ, verse 10, and in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. Did you catch it? In Jesus, You have been given everything you ever need to live a life of spirituality. You have been given everything you ever need to live life to the fullest for God. That he didn't leave parts out and go, hey, you know what? When you're good enough and you take all those steps, then I'll begin to give you. Do you know that he's already given you everything you will ever need right here, right now? There's nothing left to earn, nothing left to gain. There's nothing left for you to do. Now all you got to do is keep him the center, keep the fullness the center and let it ripple out to everybody else. That is the center that Jesus is God and God is in you and you are in him. And all you have to do is stay in him. He is Still in verse 10, he is the head over every power and authority. So we are big language. This is who God is. He's over everything. 
is back to supremacy. That he's enough for you and he's supreme. And then he says this. Verse 11. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Huh. Right, we're just scraping the Milky Way, right, of who God is. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah, and you, you, you had a circumcision that wasn't performed by, you were circumcised, but not by human hands. Excuse me? Circumcision in the Bible has to do with a very distinct law that God gave to the Israelites. That if they were going to be his people, then they were going to carry this out in their community. And what it declared is they were set apart and they were God's. They were God's people. But what I want you to catch, because there's a huge different difference that's being played out here. Because in those days, they were the ones that physically were circumcising their children, right? Their boys. And so it was a work that they did in obedience to what God had asked. But this is talking about, hey, hey, God for you. So it's using that picture. Paul's using that picture to write to Colossae because there were Jews and Gentiles there. And a lot of times there were arguments over, well, you Gentiles who don't believe in circumcision, you need to do this. And they're like, excuse me, not going to happen. And so there would be conflicts, right? But it was a very common picture that was understood in that context, in that culture, wrapped around spirituality. And for us, in him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your sinful nature was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, by Jesus. So, so now it gets really specific, right? Because it's using the imagery of circumcision, but it's talking about something that God does, not something you do, that God has done for you on the inside of you, right? So it says specifically that he put off in circumcision, he put off your old sin nature. What is a sin nature? Well, you jump all the way back to Genesis. Remember how we're talking about kids before? Like they look like you, sound like you, push your buttons like you, the whole thing. Why is that? Because in creation, what was started is that human beings would give birth to the like, to their kind, right? So that's why you may look back several generations and go, man, I look like my great grandfather. Why? Because we give birth to those like us. They carry our DNA, another thing that we carry because sin entered in the garden, every human on the planet is born with a sin nature. Every single one. Because we pass it on like a disease, right? That every person born is born with what's known as a sin nature. Now your sin nature can only do one thing. And this is why if you don't know Jesus and you're in the room, like I don't mean this disrespectfully, but this is why church, and I'm talking to people that would claim to be, man, I'm the family of God, I'm a believer, right? If that's you, don't ever get mad as someone who doesn't know Jesus for choosing themselves every single time. They can't do anything else. You know why? They were born with a sin nature that is eyes on them. And we're not so great because we were born with it too. You know the only difference? is that when you met Jesus by grace, through faith, it says that he performed the circumcision on you. He cut away the sin nature. He put it off. The language is like a garment. That He took a garment off of you, the sin nature that was only focused on you all the time, and all your decisions come out of that. He put it off, and, and now it is separated from you because that is the work that Jesus does for you. And that deserves some kind of, man, that's life changing. <laughs> Y'all, this is the greatest story ever told. Because you know what that means? Today, you have the opportunity to live a sinless day. You have the opportunity today to live a sinless day. You know why? 
because it was put off. You know, the difference is when I choose to take it and put it on like it's a garment that I still should wear. When I choose to take my old nature and put it back on the nature that Romans says has been rendered inoperative, it has no power over you. I choose to pick it up and put it on me and act like it has power. You do not have to live under the weight of sin today. Jesus has paid it all. Jesus has separated it out from you. Everything, when Jesus is at the center, everything outward changes from that moment. Every part of your ripple changes. Why? Because if I truly believe and I truly sit with Jesus at center and I go, Jesus, I'm going to keep you the center. Why? Because, because I know that in you, if I continue in you, I won't choose self. If I continue in you, I will not step into, I will have my eyes on others. Still in verse 13, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, so when you were dead, when you were dead, sorry, I totally skipped the whole section. Let me jump backwards. Verse 11, sorry, Kylie. Kylie's in the back. Can you give Kylie a hand? I've given her a pain all morning. And she doesn't even like my pants, so there you go. Partway through verse 11, your sinful nature was put off when you were circumcised by Jesus. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So so, so, so now it gets into a very specific picture, right? That what happened in baptism, right? What we're declaring in baptism today is that we were buried That means you died along with Jesus. And what happened is that old sin nature was actually put off. It was rendered inoperative. It has no power. Your old life is dead and you came alive with Christ when you were raised to life. That you're not dead today. That you have full life today. And just like we're gonna experience in a minute, do you know what happens by the way when people get in the water? and they stand in the middle and they're asked questions and everything goes still in the water, guess what happens next? They make a ripple with their life, right? For all of us to see, because they're declaring, they're declaring, I believe this story to be true of me and that I've been changed from the inside out. And what you're experiencing is the ripple of their choices, the ripple of that change. And then it goes to when you were dead in your sins in verse 13, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature. So when you were dead, when you couldn't do anything but make it all about you. God, what's the next word? God made you alive in Christ. Why does that matter so much? Because you need to catch God is the one doing the work, not you. Your life and being alive comes from God himself showing up on your behalf in the person of Christ and making you alive today. He forgave us all, all our sins. Like, like you need to know today that no matter what you came in the room carrying, you may think you're the worst person. You don't belong here. You may be living under shame, under guilt of choices. That's you and your old sin nature carrying that. You know why? Because God has removed those and he has forgiven you all sins. There's nothing in your past that has a place in your present. If your past doesn't die, your future will not live. You have to put it where it belongs and it belongs in a tomb. And when you are raised out of the water, the the, the imagery is that you're raised clean. You're raised fresh. You're back to life. Jesus came out of the tomb with a resurrected body. That's the imagery you're given. He forgave us all our sins, verse 14, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to a cross. That you today, what is true of you today, 
as that your debt before God is gone because Jesus chose to take it and nail it to the cross. And it would be like you going down and taking your legal document saying you're guilty, ripping it off the cross and carrying it around. That's the imagery that's given here. You need to know that today you are free. Now, this is the greatest story ever told. This is the greatest healing you will ever find. This is the greatest, and in your shirts say it, changed. This is the greatest life change that can ever happen. And it's by grace through faith in the person of Jesus that needs to stay the center because everything changes from the center outward. I'm over time, but I'm gonna tell you a story anyways. Um, I drove out to LA this Thursday uh, with my two oldest kids. And uh, we've been planning it since Christmas. And we got in the car and we were intentionally going to a concert at the Greek theater. And uh, we get out there and, and y'all, it's a concert where uh, there's some words that you may not hear in church. You know, you might've heard it driving to church, but not in church, right? <laughs> and then one of the artists, I, I don't know, like I just, maybe I'm getting old. It just made me laugh. I mean, in between every song, they decided to vape, which I'm like, it can't be good for your vocal cords because you're a singer. Like I said, I'm getting old. But what got me was as I'm standing there, 6,000 people, places sold out. The lead singer of the group we'd gone to see, his name is Paul. I have never seen a singer have so much passion for every single word that came out of his mouth than that young man. Like I've never seen it. He believed and felt so deeply what he was about to sing and what he began to sing that every ounce of who he was, every bit of his fiber could not contain what he was trying to express to a group of people. And then on top of that, the entire crowd, all of a sudden, hands up, know every word and are singing back just as passionately, probably not just as passionately, but trying to, these lyrics that I gotta tell you, they don't even make sense. It was a breakup album. It's his perspective. And now you got young girls singing it back to him. And I'm going, this makes no sense. They don't even, these words don't even line up. And all of a sudden my mind went to the church. That if you're new to church and you've walked in here and you go, it's weird, man. You guys start with this like group karaoke thing. That's one perspective. But as I'm standing there and I'm watching, I like that there, there was this girl like five seats down, right? And, and, and she must have danced every single song. I mean, good Lord, how she did that is a miracle. But she had so much life inside of her for this moment. And I started going, God, why is the church so apathetic when it comes to worship? Why is it that we sing words on a screen like they don't matter? Y'all, we have the greatest story ever told. Do you understand? We have the biggest life change ever inside of you right here, right now. And you're about to sing about a Jesus who has changed everything. And we stand here like robots sometimes. Y'all, if a bunch of teenage girls can have passion for breakup songs. I'm pretty sure if Jesus has really changed you from the inside out, we can have a little passion for what we're about to sing. And I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that when we begin to talk about the reckless love of God, that if it really is reckless and it really has chased you down, then I probably should look like it. And on top of that, and I don't mean to get into theological debates, 
But here's the thing. No one had to tell any of these people that it was okay to raise their hand or you shouldn't raise your hand or please don't dance, young lady. It was just what she felt. And good Lord, could we please for the sake of who we are and for the sake of a whole bunch of people that need to know we've been encouraged in spirit and in our soul. Actually go, I don't really care about the people around me in this moment and I don't care because this is about me and my creator who when I begin to read that story, I begin to go, oh, you're worth it all. You're worth it all. And I'll center my soul back on you. And so, God, we come before you today. God, as we just begin to let resonate those words of being encouraged in soul and united in love, and God, that you would want us to know all things pertaining to the mystery of Jesus. That the encouragement you left behind for us through Paul is that we would just continue on in you. That we wouldn't move from center. And so today I pray that we would just center back. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for chasing us down. Thank you for um, this story that declares we are free, that the debt that we had is gone. Thank you that our sins are forgiven today. Thank you that today, God, we stand with what would be a controlling of every motion and every moment through the sinful nature. You have done the work to remove that, that God, we stand here and today we can be sinless because of you. And so God, as we begin to sing and we begin to declare these truths, would you allow the passion within our souls to unite with your spirit? And God, may we declare loudly because you are worth it who you are and what you have done for us. God, thank you for rescuing us. Thank you that we are family today. And God, may you get all the glory from everything we do in these moments, from singing to baptisms to singing again, God. We just declare you are good and you are God and you are the author of our story. And everybody said,